Welcome to the Teachers of BC podcast. Real stories, real teachers, real life. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Indigenous people of British Columbia. Haichka. All right. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. We are so excited to be here. We are at North Otter Elementary School with Mrs. Jen Robinson, who is the uh, kindergarten teacher, one of the kindergarten teachers at North Otter Elementary School. And I am super, super excited to be sitting down with you today because you have an area of specialization um, that I think is going to be very interesting for our um, podcast listeners to tune into. I personally am lucky enough um, not only just to call you a coworker. <laughs> um, you were here with us uh, two years ago? 2017. 2017, uh, Ms. Robinson was at North Otter teaching a term contract, and uh, we managed to get her back uh, as a kindergarten specialist. So we are really, really excited uh, to have her at the school, and we are also super stoked that you... Um, you know, want to be part of our podcast and want to share your story with everybody who uh, is listening right now. So, uh, let's get started. <laughs> How long, Miss Robinson, have you been teaching? I've now taught in the classroom for, this is my sixth year, but before that, I was 17 years as a, as a support worker. Support worker. Yeah. And what, like, what did that look like for you? It was in the classroom working one-on-one -on -one or supporting classroom teachers. Um, sometimes I was in multiple classrooms. It's it's the face of the SEA now, mm -hmm. but it was for the VSB. Vancouver School Board. Yep. Cool. Um, did you have an area, even then, an area of specialization that you, maybe um, a, a, like a age group that you really enjoyed working with? Yeah. Um, how it started was when I left, and I, I did a counseling program at Douglas College, and then I left and got on with the VSB, and I was specifically... They had a title and it was called the APW. It was Alternate Program Worker, which mm -hmm. meant um, at that time there was no job banding. So um, you were either working with children with profound special needs or you worked with kids that were behaviors. So I was a direct behavior. I wouldn't have gotten called out or done jobs that were um, physical needs or anything like that or autism. It was all strictly a behavior thing. Oh, very cool. So, and then it morphed in, you know, the changing of positions and then you ended up being in schools supporting in classrooms and then um, you would be supporting in programs as well because I worked in, in programs as well. Mm, very nice. Mm -hmm. um, did you prefer working with older kids or younger kids? Young, it's always been younger. I vote my career um, has always been K to seven, mm. always. So. Had you, uh, did you ever work in high school? Uh, one day, and it was at Lord Bing. Oh. And I went, um, people are spitting in the hallway, <laughs> and nobody's listening to me. So this is not the gig for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew pre I knew pretty close that I, at that moment that I didn't, my career was definitely going to be, and my passion because of the learning um, for that age group is a younger awesome. primary. That's awesome. What grade levels and subjects do you teach currently? I'm teaching K, um, which is new to me because I've all, well, it's not necessarily new. When I was in Vancouver, I was teaching a district behavior class that was turning into more kindergarten, but it was technically grade one to three, and it was tiered, like tier three kids. There was nowhere, they, they didn't fit into a typical classroom, and they were in my room with two, me, my classroom, a, a support worker, a youth and family worker and 10 kids. That was my maximum. So it, it's always been, but now I'm doing this K because with my social emotional learning, um, I found that I wanted to really get my hands on kindergarten so I could give them this social emotional learning from the out the gate of b their school experience. Because I knew, to me, that was important. Like I think these skills are super important and um, they need to be woven into everything that you do and what I do every single day. And you see the proof in the pudding, right? Because oh, absolutely. Because you're able to see how they're regulated, how we talk about feelings. And, and, and it, that came from my experience in Vancouver working with kids that had none of these skills due to the vulnerabilities and the deficits that they came into my program having. Mm -hmm. So I realized at that moment how important these skills were and I was like I wanted to get my hands on a kindergarten class mm -hmm. and I had the opportunity in Langley yeah you did and, yeah uh, they're loving you these kids the, the kindergartens that we have they're really really excited to be in your room mm -hmm. and you have a very interesting um like 
you have a very interesting calmness about your room and the way that your kids are able to regulate themselves so well and it's you know it's february we're halfway through and they can yeah. do so much already on their own it's pretty incredible stuff it just goes to show how important that social emotional component is. is what do you find is the biggest problem uh, through your observations as an educator that has worked from K to 7, what do you find um, the behavior issues are when that piece has obviously been missing? I, You know, it's, it's hard because, you know, teachers throw out that word autonomy, mm -hmm. and I think this is separate from autonomy because if you don't look at the brain of a child, and I call it the square peg round hole syndrome, if you keep trying to jam a square peg into a round hole, it's never going to fit. And until you open up the the realm of, of thinking that no kid is the same, no kid learns the same, you have to accept what level they're at and bring them up. But if you narrow-mindedly, I, I don't mean to be judgmental in that, but if you narrow-mindedly keep thinking, this is what it's supposed to be, this is a curriculum, this is what I'm supposed to teach... You're never going to get those kids, especially the behavior kids, because if you aren't flexible in your teaching on how you're dealing with kids and how you're not dealing with kids, you you can't you can't you can't teach them how to be flexible if you're not flexible in the way that you're dealing with them in your classroom. Gotcha. And that's the uh, that's what I find is the biggest piece that if you're not flexible and you're not and you have to have a relationship with these guys in order for them to trust you that they're going to be on this journey and you're going to teach them and bring them along. To show them how they're supposed, like, uh, I hate having to say how they're supposed to be. That's not what it is. But it's you, more you, of, you've talked about explicit instruction. It's right? at, that is the key to everything. You have to. We we, I think as educators assume that they're coming in, especially kindergarten, that they're coming in with these skills, and more and more with technology, they are so completely tapped out the from far behind, from far behind be. yeah, yeah of knowing how do you talk to somebody how do you interact with someone and it's becoming more and more apparent that technology I feel this is my own opinion is technology is really impacting the social emotional learning of kids mm -hmm. because they're detached they don't have to listen they're activated all the time so they don't have to read their body and they don't know how they are feeling because they've been told how they're feeling mm -hmm. Or, you know, they're, they're immersed in this fake world and now we're expecting them to work in the real world and then we're wondering why they're struggling. Mm -hmm. so. There's some really interesting research on screen time in children. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's out there. I've read some really interesting articles. I've seen some, <laughs> ironically, some very interesting videos on YouTube about how uh, technology and screen time in general affects yeah. children in just lots of different ways. And the first thing I always do with my families in... Because I always build a, I try to build a really good relationship with my families because I want them to trust me that I, I know what I'm doing and what I see when their kids are at school. Mm -hmm. So when I have that first parent interview, it's like, what's their bedtime? What does that look like? Tell me what that looks like. Um, what's their screen time like? And then that's when I start to insert the information that I, I know and I see because it comes out here is a simple act of giving your kid an iPad just before bed actually activates their brain. It doesn't bring their brain down. They're actually supposed to stop that an hour before you yeah. even bring them down because their brains need to know to turn off because there's so much stimulation, mm -hmm. your brain doesn't know it's supposed to be resting. As a parent, it's really interesting because I've read that bit of research and we've actually started powering down even earlier. So mm -hmm. I, for those of you who don't know very much about me in podcast land, I have a six-year-old son who is in grade one, um, very, very um, intelligent and very uh, sensitive. So struggles with big feelings and a very bright kid. But I find that if I do that one and a half hours before bed of even if he gets screen time half right. the time, he doesn't even bother because we're busy playing a board game or busy doing his sight words yep. or busy doing something different. Um, I find that that really, really makes a difference mm -hmm. on their, not even like uh, quantity, but quality of sleep. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, he's not as tired in the morning. He's rested. He's feeling good and ready for the day. And he's, you know, not a big grump in the morning. And that, and that I makes tell, a difference. And I tell my class and we talk about it all the time because I say to them, I said, why do babies need to sleep so much? And I said, because they're growing. Mm -hmm. When babies are sleeping, they're growing. And your brains are still growing. And we all, they, my guys all know about the prefrontal cortex and the, hy the hippocampus and the amygdala. They know all that does and what they need to do 
to keep their brain healthy and sleep and eat and all those and exercise. And I tell them all the time, it's super important that they realize that when you're sleeping, you're giving your brain and your body time to grow and rest and get ready for the next day. Mm -hmm. So I try to make them a little bit responsible for it because I know six-year-olds aren't responsible for bedtime. They just aren't. Mm -hmm. It's the parents. Yeah. You can't fault a six-year-old if their parents letting them go to bed at 10 o'clock. Yeah, but no. I know I can insert that yeah. <laughs> throughout my day here mm -hmm. saying this is what you need. Because, yeah, do I have two or three of them that are I know are staying up late? And they're watching TV or playing on a tablet or computers and and how, you know, I can just do and insert and give them the information that they can start to sort of make a bit of a decision about that. And you talk a lot about what you feel like kids need to be successful. You've told me, you know, personally as a as a mother of a six year old coming to you for advice on regulation <laughs> and as a coworker uh, with your own kids, but you you've emphasized that they need love, discipline and structure. Absolutely. Consistency, predictability. And I tell these guys from the outset, like we I'm like, what are we? We are a family. And we if when I frame it like that, we start to it shifts the responsibility. They start to talk about um, looking after each other and it kind of naturally flows into that but the predictability part of that takes away their anxiety because if they know what's happening and they feel safe it's amazing the learning that happens because they're willing to take chances in their learning yeah. the predictable the consistent and they all know and I say this all the time they know where I stand mm -hmm. they know they're like they can process and know if I've done this I know this is gonna happen mm -hmm. there's no you know, gray area for them mm -hmm. because I'm pretty consistent in, in my message. And with your discipline tactic as well. Right, like right. I, I find that you're very consistent about that and they know. It's like if they do something out of line, it's really interesting because they'll almost go and put themselves. Yeah, like, they figure it out. They figure it yeah. out. Yeah, it's really interesting. So what I, I think that our, interest, our listeners are particularly interested in is um, if you have any stories about what particularly got you into education, in the field of education, because I know you said you did 17 years uh, being a support worker and then you, you went back to school and did your teaching. Mm -hmm. So was there something in your life uh, or s some person or some situation that really got you thinking, I should go into education, I should go into teaching? Well, I had an administrator and I had a teacher that I worked with. And I think I took a lot of my practice from her because I thought what she was doing was groundbreaking, but it was just who she was. But she was ahead of her time in Vancouver, of all things. But I had an admin who pulled me aside and said, I don't know if you know about this, but SFU has a program specifically de designed for people with already has this experience. Um, and it's workable like it's not like you're you don't have to miss school you don't have to miss work so also bridging your support work gap to yeah. the actual classroom so you still gap. had to yeah. apply and what I didn't real what I didn't realize was it's actually more competitive than PDP is wow I so know. what was the program name it's called the uh, professional linking program oh so it's PLP gotcha so PLP and uh, I applied and I got in I didn't think I, I was an adult learner like I think I got accepted when I was 40 40 mm -hmm. and uh, you know it took 16 months but you did uh, nights sometimes weekends um, in the summer the, the, you know and then the VSB at the time I don't know if the other districts were but the VSB at the time gave me a 10-week leave of absence to do my practicums oh wow mm -hmm. and incredible. it was good because a lot of the places you know where they were placing students we got placed in some pretty vulnerable areas because we'd already worked in them. Mm. Like I most of my career, really <laughs> most of the, my career was on the downtown east side. So, mm. you know, I was working at, you know, some of the most vulnerable schools in the Vancouver school board. So I already had that behind me. Right. And then going into the PLP and then became a teacher. And then, and now I'm in my master's. Mm. Mm. Big girl. Oh, big girl pants. Big girl pants. <laughs> But I think, I think the ultimate piece was I had an administrator that was talking about how um, how she she saw me as an educator. Uh, she saw me as an educator, and she kind of, you know, just says you need to you need. She she actually looked at me and says you need to do this. I'm not I'm not I'm not taking no from you, mm -hmm. and I was pretty comfy. Mm -hmm. Own my.